welcome everyone to wherever you are um, from my isolation station to yours um, we are experiencing some turbulence in the force these days so um, hopefully this time together can uh, assist us all in um, in connecting to each other and to um, to a sense of, of stability and possibility um, within and beyond uh, the current chaos um, that is um, present in the world and uh, in many of our homes and, and hearts. So um, thank you all for being here and, and being with us and sharing space, time, and soul in, uh, in ways that we can uh, these days. So. Um, we're only together for about half an hour, so um, I'm just going to kind of jump into it. Um, so lace up, uh, strap up, get your pens, notes, iPhones, um, whatever you need to uh, take notes for yourself, um, mental notes, whatever. Um, but we're going to just launch into it and also... Uh, just as a little caveat, like Julie said, there's going to be a seven-week course. We're going to meet together every Monday night um, at 8.30 for half an hour to uh, learn and meditate on, um, on, on this, on this Svirata Omer and where we are in that process. This week being the introductory week, um, we are going to attempt to move through a large amount of material and also um, information. This week will probably be more heavy on information and the following weeks will probably lean more towards inspiration. So we're gonna vacillate always in each week between information and inspiration, but this week just to, prepare you for for what's about to come down the pipe is a bit more heavy on information i'm going to assume as i've been directed um no prior knowledge so uh anybody at any level can um attempt to to jump into this material of course there will be questions and i'm not going to cover everything exhaustively i'm going to throw out a lot of um I'm going to open up a lot of files uh, also that we will continue to revisit throughout the coming weeks. So if I don't exhaust a topic or say everything about some idea or theme this week, be patient. We're going to be returning to these things. You know, the, it's 40 years through the wilderness. This tour is not a straight line. Um, we're going to be kind of circuitously coming around various axes and axioms. Um, so if you're familiar with something and said, yeah, but you didn't say this, eh, just, just be patient, chill out, let it wash over you. We'll get there or we won't, we'll get somewhere. And, um, and, uh, but this, this week we're gonna, we're gonna really try to set up a foundation so anybody can join in to the to these weeks of learning and also i'm hoping that for those who do have a large amount of background knowledge um, or exposure to uh, the practice or the ideas um, embedded within Svirata omer that um, as we know from torah we've been reading the same book for thousands of years so just because you've uh, covered the material before doesn't mean you can't learn something new maybe i'll phrase it in a new way or maybe you will hear it in a new way, um, depending on the circumstances of our collective life or your personal process, wherever you may be at. So without further ado, I'm going to pull back the bow and the words from my heart will hopefully enter into your heart. Okay, so what are we gonna be learning together? On the most basic level, there's gonna be a weekly class on the Omer cycle. That means we're gonna be learning about Svirata Omer in general. What is Svirata Omer? What is this practice? What is this? And we're also gonna be learning about each Svira. That's a technical Kabbalistic term. We will be revisiting it. So if you're already lost, don't worry. Just 
I don't want to say suspend your disbelief, but suspend your feeling of what is this dude talking about? We'll continue, vocab will build as if, if you're not familiar with this stuff, as if you're in a foreign country and you just hear the same words over and over and over again, and eventually you go, oh, that's kind of what that means. Okay, and most people that have studied this material for decades, if you ask them to define what a sphera is, you're gonna get a real slippery fish of an answer. So anybody that pretends like they actually know what these things really mean, they are not to be trusted. Um, so we're going to be looking at Sfirata Omer in general, and each week, because of the nature of, and of the structure of how Sfirata Omer works, we're going to be looking at each of the seven lower Sfirot week by week to get more of a sense and an understanding um, and a graspless grasp of the essence of each of these seven different spiritual qualities and energetic capacities that are expressed through the spherotic tree, which we will be learning about uh, briefly. Uh, as I said, this week's going to be a more general introduction to the mitzvah itself, counting the sphera, counting the omer. Sphirata omer means counting the omer. Um, it's actually a mitzvah, like keeping Shabbos or um, giving tzedakah or um, being nice to your parents or all of those things. It's, it's actually considered a mitzvah. So we're going to be, uh, this week's going to be a general introduction to that mitzvah, the pra how, how that mitzvah is performed, and some of the underpinnings and mythos and textual roots of that mitzvah, as well as an overview at the end of uh, the first sphera of the, of the seven lower spherot, uh, which is called chesed. I'm not going to explain that now. We'll get to it later. We have less than half an hour, so away we go. So what's Sfirata Omer? On the most basic level, I'll just say that Sfirata Omer, which again I mentioned, means counting the Omer. Okay, so we define Sfirat. Sfira means counting. Um, and now we have to, so what does Omer mean? Sfirata Omer. But Sfirata Omer is counting the Omer. And essentially, it's a practice of counting each day between Passover and the next major holiday, which is Shavuot. Sounds simple enough. Counting each day. Okay, but what does that mean? You wake up, one, two. Okay, so what's the big deal? Um, don't we all have calendars? Aren't we counting days all the time? What, what, what is the difference in quantity or quality of this counting from the way we count every other day? Um, so on the most basic level, it's counting the days between Passover and Shavuot. Okay, so where does this come from? We're just going to hit, of course, go back to the root of where uh, much of uh, Jew Jewish thought and practice comes from, although I won't say all. Uh, we're going to go straight to the Torah. Um, so it's, uh, if we look in Parshat Amor, um, in uh, the book of Vayikra, also known as Leviticus, chapter 23, verses 10 through 17, we will find um, in kind of a list, not a list, but in, in a, after um, detailing different practices of the priests that function in the temple, God then tells Moses, and now we are going to list off all of the holidays, the major holidays that are included in the Torah. And these are the basic uh, calendrical uh, signposts and, 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 um, and, and observatory decks uh, that you will come to throughout your travel through the year. Um, and so it begins in Paso with Passover. And then it goes and it says in verse 10, speak to the children of Israel and say to them, when you come to the land, which is the land of Israel after they left Egypt, which I am giving to you and you reap its harvest, you shall bring to the Kohen, the, the priest who functions in the temple, an Omer of the beginning of your reaping. So first off, let's just define what an Omer is. An Omer is a, is a measurement. It's a weight. It's like uh, an ancient ounce or something like that. It, I, I did, you can look up online if you want to know, what is an Omer actually weigh? I don't know. Um, but it, it's an ancient measurement. 
It's an ancient measurement uh, unit of measurement. So when you come to the land, you bring to the Kohen in the temple an omer of the beginning of your reaping. And he shall wave the omer before the Lord so that it will be acceptable for you. The Kohen shall wave it on the day after the Shabbat. It says, uh, it uses the term Shabbat in, in the text. Um, and um, okay, so there we go. An omer, a unit of measurement. It's an offering that we bring from the harvest of the fields on the day after Passover. So then it goes on, it explains a little bit more, then we skip down a few verses and get to verse 15. And so, so, so we have basically in the first two verses, 10 and 11, okay, so there's an agricultural offering, that's the offering of the Omer. That's how it's, that's how it's referred to in the Torah, and it's a special offering, that's an, offer, an agricultural offering from the fields. Nothing about counting yet, except for, okay, you, do, you offer this on the day after Passover. Okay, so then we skip down a couple verses after it details some of how that is offered, and it says, and you shall count for yourselves from the morrow, from the day after the rest day, which is, uh, the rabbis learn out that that rest day is Passover, from the day you bring the Omer as a wave offering, seven weeks, seven weeks of seven days, and they shall be complete. You shall count until the day after the seventh week, which is the 50th day, on which you shall bring a new meal offering to the Lord. Okay, so now here comes the counting. First, we get the Omer. What's the Omer? It's a unit of measurement of a grain offering that's brought from the first harvest of the field the day after Passover. Okay, then a few verses later, and from the day that you bring that Omer offering, you count seven weeks, which is 49 days, until you get to the 50th day. And on the 50th day, you bring a new offering, which is from your dwelling places. Verse 17, from your dwelling places, you shall bring bread set aside to fresh chametzi loaves of nice, beautiful bread. So there... That is the offering that you bring 50 days after the Omer offering. Okay, so I've kind of detailed a little bit, but there's a few things to note in the Torah source. Let's just go back. So, okay, Omer offering, it's, agricul it's agricultural offering, first of the harvest, day after Pesach, right? So what's offered, the rabbis learn out. What is offered is barley. Barley, it's important to note, it was considered by the rabbis in the ancient Near East essentially as a animal feed. It was not uh, considered as chashav or as important as wheat, um, which, uh, which we know it, uh, is really an icon of, especially in the Near East, in the ancient Near East, um, and a symbol of, of, of kind of the fruits of agricultural, the peak of agricultural civilization. Bread offerings were um, played a prominent role in uh, the temple uh, in, in, in ancient Israel as well. And bread was a major component of many different ritual uh, practices um, across that um, across that geographic area in the ancient uh, days. Um, so barley, it's an interesting thing. It's, it's an offering, uh, essentially, of a very lowly grain. Um, so it ha another thing to note, as I said, it happens the day after Pesach. And then again, just to recount, we're commanded to count seven weeks leading up to the 50th day when we bring an offering of two, le uh, two loaves of bread. This brings us from Passover all the way to Shavuot. So just agriculturally and dietarily, we're mapping a process, just to make this very clear, of moving from matzah on Passover to barley, to, to chametz, to bread. So there's some sort of process that's very physical and, and agricultural, as well as if, if we have our symbol minds turned on, we're moving from unleavened bread, matzah, and everything that that represents, and then moving into barley, and working our way over a period of 49 days to the 50th day, where we're, where we're going to offer bread. I also want to say that um, we know that uh, 
this isn't an exact pairing, but I think there, it's an interesting thing to think about. Um, we refer to matzah also in three different ways. It is the bread of affliction, the bread of faith, and the bread of healing. And so there's this three-part mo movement going on from Passover, matzah, to Omer, barley, to Shavuot, Chametz, bread, that I think can also be mapped onto the movement from the ways that we understand matzah as moving from affliction to faith to healing. I think it's also very, um, it's apropos to think about in these times when the world is experiencing a lot of affliction and in need and is in need of a lot of healing, right? Um, and according to this, that there's something about faith that has a medicinal quality that allows one to move from the experience, or at the very least, the perception of affliction. Faith bridges affliction and healing, at least in this model. Okay. So in exile, without a temple, uh, we don't historically, we have not historically brought these offerings unless you go to um, Shavuot at Isabella Friedman, where, uh, the, where the First Fruits Bikurim Festival happens on Shavuot. But for the last 2,000 years, these kinds of offerings that were brought to the temple have not been offered. Um, therefore, holidays have taken on a more mythic and historical significance in addition to their seasonal and agricultural valences. So when, um, for instance, um, something like the Omer, Passover is already, uh, it talks about in the Torah, but has both a, um, an agricultural element and a historical element. It already says, you know, you eat the matzah, you do this stuff. It has agricultural significance, the beginning of spring, different offerings. And it's so you remember that we left Egypt. Okay, but the Omer, within what I just read, there's no historical significance other than the agricultural and se seasonal valence. Similarly with Shavuot, ah, oh, what's Shavuot? It's the reception of the Torah. You will find no mention of Shavuot having anything to do with the reception of the Torah in the actual Torah. That was an idea that was later mapped on um, to these agricultural cycles and observances and holidays and rituals. Um, particularly be, becoming particularly important after uh, Jews were exiled from the land and lost access to the temple. And so uh, when we kept these calendrical structures and observances in place uh, without the agricultural capacity that we once had, um, okay, so wh what do we, what do, how do we continue to draw these things out and, and, and align them with, with meaning and with our lives? Um, so my, my, mythic uh, and historical significance enters into much greater prominence, uh, it, which is mostly how we relate to these ideas uh, and holidays nowadays. What that means is that agricultural offerings have become internalized to a great extent. And, um, and so, as I mentioned earlier, we can look at, oh, moving from matzah to barley to Bread, yes, that has very clear physical, um, seasonal agricultural significance when you are living in that, that kind of lifestyle and in that kind of system. And we can also look at those things symbolically because of the last thousands and hundreds of years of, of thinking and, and imagination and, and, and poeticizing and spiritualizing and symbolizing these ideas. So when I say matzah, most of us don't just think of the cracker, we think of a, 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 a bundle of different uh, psycho-spiritual ideas. So then what I would say is, uh, just to sum it up, is the process moving from Pesach to Omer to Shavuot, to a certain way to say it is how I'll say it, is it's a kind of spiritual elimination diet. So we're taking away all the chametz. We're removing everything extraneous, and we're going back to just the most basic thing, matzah. No frills. What's, ca what, what's causing all of our flare-ups? What's causing all of our imbalances? We don't know. So we have to just, we, we have to clear everything out, and we just go to matzah. Okay, then after matzah, we go through the omer, and day by day, we add a little bit of barley back into our, um, to our diet, we add 
uh, psycho-spiritually, we take a look at all of these different aspects of, of, of ourselves and our inner world through the spherot until we're, we're able to clear out our system and get back on Shavuot to eating ah, our big fluffy chametzy loaves again. And, we're, and hopefully we've been able to identify, to identify places where we've gotten stuck and, and um, within our own um, spiritual diet and psychological processes. So kind of moving along those lines to deepen our experience of this counting, which we kept on doing, even though we weren't offering the Omer of barley the day after Passover, after we went into exile and lost the temple, but we were still counting the days, seven weeks, 49 days, leading up to the 50th day, which is Shavuot, the reception of the Torah. So the Kabbalists uh, who are always looking for geometric structures and numerological structures to map things onto said, ah, seven by seven, boom. There we go. We have the seven lower spherot of the tree of life, um, which is going to really take us from the natural world into our own internal topography. I'm going to um, just share a quick image for those who are unfamiliar and for those who are of um, this what's known as the spherotic tree of life the eight chaim um, so this is what the tree looks like i'm going to move my little cursor around a little bit it goes uh there's 10 spherot um, and it goes from the top down boom 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 all the way down and it also goes from the bottom back up as well. Um, so just on one foot, I mean, I'm not doing um, a real justice, obviously, to, to this material. But again, this is all stuff that we're going to be returning to, returning to week by week and cycling through um, continuously. So just allow things to kind of ping, settle, hold them open, we'll return to them and keep deepening them. But on one foot, um, a tr th this tree is the Kabbalistic structure of the worlds, uh, maps onto the four worlds, which is a Kabbalistic model of creation. Um, and uh, it's, it depicts a process of creation and revelation, both in terms of how the creator creates the world, how the world comes into being from the, the highest heights and the most infinite unity into particularized individuality meaning this is a map, a, a cosmological map of the creation of the world, uh, as well as uh, it maps um, particularly um, Hasidism d uh, w did a lot of work on um, identifying the ways and kind of translating that cosmological map of external creation into a psychological map of internal creation. So it also maps on our own creative process and how we receive ideas or inspiration or visions and how those things move through us until they're expressed out into the world through our words or our actions and how things, it's essentially a map of how things come into being. As I said, these spherot, and we'll explore this much more throughout the coming weeks, they map onto the four worlds of creation. They also map onto the four letter name of Hashem, the Yud, He, Vav, and He. And they also map onto the human form. And in many ways, as it says in Genesis, that um, the human is created Betzel Elohim in the image of the creative potency of the divine. This is, and the spherotic tree in many ways can be considered the Tzelem Elohim. And we'll explore that more later. Um, we have uh, the upper, three upper spherot, the Keter, Chochmah, and Bina, crown, wisdom, and understanding. Um, those are understood as being a bit out of our domain. Those are more vessels of reception, which is why when we look at the Omer, the Omer really deals with the seven lower spherot. And these are seen as the kind of curriculological, behavioral, emotional, psychological capacities that we actually can have, that we can actually work on. And um, in some ways we can, we can um, understand that really, um, especially the Omer is kind of guiding us along this process of in order to really do work or impact these upper realms, our realm, 
the fields that we can, that we can work are really these seven lower roads, and it's through purifying ourselves on these seven lower characterological, emotional, behavioral traits that we're able to then purify our vessels of higher understanding and wisdom. In many ways, uh, Kabbalah and Hasidism kind of warns people or cautions us against skipping over these relational behavioral, characterological elements of our being and trying to skip over into the higher realms without rectifying really how we relate to others and how we relate to the world and how we behave in the world in relationship. If we do not get that right as a foundation, then we can really be in some slippery waters, some dangerous choppy waters if we try to skip over that and go right up to the higher realms and so that's where we get to the work of um the om counting the omer which situates us and roots us firmly in working on these seven lower spherot and then we're, as we'll see later we'll we kind of like jump from the lowest sphera of of kingship malchut and we'll understand what that means and uh, expand our understanding of that to the upper realms uh, uh, and, and receiving of the Torah as well. Um, so I see that we have, we're already approaching um, our time limit here. Um, so I'm just gonna speed through a bit more material. Um, so essentially the practice of the 49 days of the Omer is um, that we, we count the day, starting the day after Passover, one. Two. And there's a specific formula to do that, which I'll share. And then the Kabbalistic practice is once we've counted the day with a bracha, with a blessing, um, we identify a specific um, combination of these psycho behavioral, emotional, relational qualities uh, that we meditate on and that we inspect ourselves and that we try to to um, build, our, build our capacities, build our vessels up in those particular ways. So you can see we're dealing with these seven lower spherot through seven weeks of the Omer. And the way it works is that each day we have a different combination of each of these seven. So for instance, the first day, the way it's phrased is chesed sheba chesed, the loving kindness of loving kindness. The second day would be Gevura Sheba Chesed. What's the strength? Of, this says judgment. I'll translate it as strength. So one would say, when I look into myself, what is, and, and just in general, what is the strength of loving kindness? What is the strength that is required to express loving kindness? What's the strength that's required to receive somebody's expression of loving kindness? And then one, so one asks that question in general, and then one reflects upon in, in, within their own heart. In what ways do I exhibit or lack the strength to express love and kindness in my life? Where are the, where are, what are the ways in which I'm excelling at that? Let me acknowledge those ways. What are the ways in which I'm lacking in that capacity, in which I need work? And furthermore, what are actionable items or things that I can take upon myself to build those capacities? That capacity, for instance, of developing the strength to express my inner feelings of love and kindness in relationship and in the world. So we go through, and then we get to Tiferet Sheba Chesed, Netzach Sheba Chesed. So each week is defined by one Sphera. The first week is defined by Chesed, that's the root. And then we look at each of these def different, seven different ways to refract on and reflect on that root quality. And then the second week is defined by the next sphera of gavura, of strength. And then we go, ah, what's the chesed sheba gavura? What's the love and kindness of strength? Where, in what ways does strength actually come from love? When I, when I express or exhibit strength or discipline or boundaries, in what ways is that rooted in love? And in what ways should it be rooted in love in which it's not rooted in love? It's rooted in, reactive, in reactivity or fear, but I want to root it in love. So where am I lacking in that? 
So then the third week is Tiferet, Netzach, so on. And then we, refer, we, we take one week to focus on a sphera, on one of these characterological traits, and then we look at it in seven different ways as we move through the tree, and we continue to go through that cycle. It begins, the first day of the Omer is the Chesed Sheba Chesed, the loving kindness of loving kindness. And the last day is Malchut Sheba Malchut. That's the kingship of kingship. That's a really hard one to translate. We'll look at that much more and expand that and kind of explode that concept of what that really means. Malchut Sheba Malchut. And then when we get all the way down, that's when we're purified. Hopefully we've done the work and we're ready to receive the Torah on the 50th day of Shavuot, which we bring the two loaves, which obviously represent the two tablets of the ten of, upon which the Ten Commandments are written on, which also obviously reflect the two lobes of our heart because we want the Torah to be inscribed upon our heart as well. So we'll, we'll be worming and working our way through all of these weeks and all of these spherot until week by week, until we hopefully get to the point where we're ready to receive the Torah. Of course, there's tons more details and halachot regarding spherot to Omer. We're going to explore those throughout the coming weeks. Again, this is not an exhaustive introduction. Um, but um, so just for one quick second, and we'll return to this next week because I don't want to give this, um, this first sphere short shrift. But the first, so the first week, we're in the first week, um, which is focused on chesed, loving kindness. This class, you may have noticed, is entitled The Love That Loves to Love. Pure chesed is just pure love, pure expansion, pure giving, no restriction, no fear, no constriction. One thing that's important to point out is there's three pillars of the tree. There's the right side, the left side, and the middle. One very easy energetic way to think about these um, three sides is everything on the right side of the tree from Chochmah Chesed to Netzach is expansive, expressive, going out, connective. Everything on the left side of the tree is constrictive, internalizing, um, bound, boundary-based, um, looking within, um, and, and definition-oriented rather than kind of infin in, infinitely expansive. The middle pillar, Tiferet Yesod Malchut, is integrating. So we have love, fear, balance of Tiferet, harmony, of, of expansion and constriction. And then we have the integration of, the, of those two movements in, in a harmonic balance because sometimes it is good to be expansive and sometimes we do need to create boundaries. So we'll look more at those sides of the tree and specifically at chesed and gavura as a dialectical pair next week. But for this week, and for, for we should be focusing, the Omer is focusing us on love, on expansiveness, on, um, on that urge to express, to give, to connect, that wells up deep within us and moves us outside of ourselves into connection with other, with world, with God, with each other. And it wells up from within us and, and it moves us outside of ourselves into connection. Um, and, um, and love, you know, what, what, what do you say about love? Hopefully we all have our own understandings of what love means. Next week, again, like I said, we'll be looking at it more in, in dialectic tension with Gevura. And we'll look at love and fear and chesed and Gevura more as a pair next week. And we'll look Kabbalistically and, uh, and according to Hasidut, a bit more detailed and what are the psychodynamics um, that are incorporated into each of those qualities. but. Um, so tonight, um, I just want to say, uh, so tonight we're going to be counting. Um, also, people are um, chiming in and, and tuning in from all across the United States and, and who knows from where else. So I don't want to say we're going to count the Omer together. 
because for some people, they might not be ready to count the Omer. We count the Omer after sundown, so it only happens at a specific time. This week, um, I'm going to do another screen share really quick. And I'm going to direct us. This is uh, on a really great website called opensidur.org. And I just want to show, uh, to walk people through a bit of the practice uh, and, and, and of, of how one counts the Omer. So I'm going to say the bracha, and then I'm going to count the, um, I'm going to count the day, and I'm going to equate it with its spherotic, with its spherot and its spherotic significance in order that I can then talk about it a bit more and offer each, everybody a bit of a meditation to take home with them as they can do their own counting. So on the most basic level, again, we're going to be returning to this week by week. Um, on the most basic level, like I said, the practice of counting the Omer is you say this bracha that you can see at the top of your page right here. Then there's a formula for saying what number day it is. And then there's a Kabbalistic way of saying what the spherot are. I'm going to do that. You can say amen. You don't have to. Um, you can count along with me. Uh, you can count after me after this call. And after I count, I'm just going to offer a quick meditation or a couple of ideas for one to consider as they count. And then I'm going to look forward to seeing everybody next week. Again, I apologize for going a bit over time. Uh, but as you can tell, there was a lot of material that I just wanted to kind of lay the foundation for this week. Next week, we'll be able to dig in and really hone in and focus in and, and kind of get much deeper into much fewer um, topics. But I wanted to give a broad foundation for everybody to enter into. So without any further ado, to count the Omer for tonight. Baruch atah Adonai Eloheinu Melech HaOlam Asher Kiddushanu B'mitzvotav V'tivanu Al Sfirat HaOmer Hayom Chamisha Yamim LeOmer Hod Shebechesed Today is five days of the Omer, which is the Sfirot of Hod within chesed, hod shebe chesed, hod, just very briefly, hod, we're going to be meeting on hod night every week, which is awesome, because we're going to have a class on Lagba Omer, and if we're all still in isolation, it'll be very nice for us to all get together and learn a bit about Lagba Omer and hod shebe hod, but hod, on one foot, really, it just means a lot of different things, but I think what's pertinent for right now is it, mean, it, it means acknowledgement, and just acknowledging. It means a lot of different things. It can also mean praise and, and a billion different things, but praise also is an expression of, of, of acknowledgement of something. So I just want to offer us some things to think about after we get off this class. If you're going to count the Omer, here are some very quick things to keep in mind. In times like these, it is so important to take a moment away from all the fear and anxiety and judgment in order to focus our awareness on the real concrete places within our life that love exists and expresses itself. In what ways are you experiencing the energy of chesed in your life? In what ways are you receiving love, even in these times of fear and anxiety? Take a moment to hod shebe chesed, to acknowledge and identify the ways in which you are receiving love, even in these crazy, crazy times in which fear and anxiety often drown out our awareness and acknowledgement of what's good, of what's loving, of where we feel loved and held in our lives. In what ways are you projecting or performing love for others? Not only to reflect on what and acknowledge the ways in which we're feeling loved, in which we're receiving love, but in what ways, in what areas are we projecting or performing love for others? In what ways are we expressing, acknowledging those ways that we're, whether they're small or large, that we're expressing chesed, love, to others outside of ourselves in the world? Also, in what ways are we performing or projecting love for ourselves? Because we're all going crazy in isolation right now. Self-love is even more important 
than 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 in normal times because we're we're being pushed to our limits psychologically and emotionally in a million different ways. And we're being cut off from so many of our connections and so many of the ways in which we were nourished by love from others. We're cut off from them in so many ways. So in what ways are we performing and projecting love with, for, for ourselves, performing self-love? Acknowledge those ways. They say that what the world needs now is love, sweet love, but sometimes it is merely a matter of noticing and acknowledging of holding how much chesed or love we already have access to. Now, outside of acknowledging those moments of the bounty of love that we're, that we're already currently experiencing in ways that we were aware of or ways that maybe we hadn't been aware of until we brought our awareness to that, that act of acknowledgement, also try to take a moment to think about the areas in your life or in the world that need more love. Take a moment to acknowledge those places and people that are lacking in love. Think hard, real, concrete, how you might be able to channel more love into those areas that you are able to identify and acknowledge are in need of love. And so much of the world right now is in suffering and is in need of love, including ourselves. Identify and acknowledge those areas, those channels, those directions that we can blast, broadcast our chesed out into the world in more concentrated and, and um, rectified and intentional ways. Now, I bid you adieu, farewell, l'chaim, in good health, peace be with you. See, hopefully see you next week. We'll get much more into the sfirot and the psychodynamics and the details and how these things play out in Kabbalistic and Hasidic teachings beyond all these things. But now you have a bit of a general overview of what is Sfirat Omer, where it came from, and how you count those str these strange days that we're living within. God bless. Hod Peace.